Well, uh, thank you very much, Marty, and thank you, Karen. Last year, I communicated with this group by video. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to come uh, but for personal reasons. And so, as some of you may know, uh, Karen is not a man to be trifled with. And he said, you promised to come. We love the video, but next time you have to come yourself. So here I am, Karun. I uh, really wanted to do this because I think that these initiatives are really very critical. And what I'd like to do in my early comments and then what I'd like to have is really a give and take rather than just a one-way one lecture is to discuss what I think are the fundamental issues that we're facing and I'll come at it not just from the R&D standpoint or the scientific standpoint or what I've been, you know, I've been an academic and then in government and now in industry. I really like to come at it from the public health and what is really happening in all of these areas worldwide and discuss it in relationship to the U.S.-India relationship which is really at this point a global India relationship to the extent that most of what is happening today can no longer be limited to a geography. Why is that? If you really uh, think as a scientist, you realize that we've made extraordinary progress in understanding basic biology. Uh, we have actually be, uh, we've been humbled by the complexity that we have discovered. In the 70s, the concept of a magic bullet for cancer was predominant and we funded the war on cancer and many of you remember that and the complexity that we have uncovered through the works of genomics and proteomics and the many other uh, scientific endeavors that were overtaken has led us to understand that biological systems that are much more complex than what we thought they were. On the, other, on the other hand, we've also started to understand populations and populations of patients at different levels of complexity. And from the genome studies, from the ability to see variations across human genomes, variations across regions, variations even within the same pathology, within the same patient. How many types of cancer do we have today? And so the second axis of what we are facing as a community to overcome the scientific challenge is, on the one hand, the complexity of human biology. On the other hand, the heterogeneity of human populations. And how do you tackle that is, in my view, the central core issue of all of the organizations we're dealing with that, that we need to overcome. Many people say, well, the loss of productivity in R&D is due to organizational issues, too big a company, companies are too big, and uh, regulation, regulation is more complicated. And those are true factors, but at the end of the day, what I think is true is that we have, we're hitting a scientific barrier, and we have to find a way to overcome that barrier with a different model, a different way of approaching these issues. I was at a meeting, actually, at BIO, uh, and um, the BIO organizes a yearly meeting of uh, annual uh, encounter, if you will, of the capital banks and venture funds and the CEOs. And this was in New York. I was invited. It was the NIH director. And I asked the audience at that time, I say, how many of you, and I'll ask you, think we know 80% of what we need to know to be really effective in um, R&D? No one raised their hands. And then I said 50%. No one raised their hands. And I said 25%. There was a bold uh, guy out there he raised his hand, and then I said 15, a few more, 10. Well, 10, everybody said, well, we know 10% of what we need to know. And so I turned to the bankers, and I said, how can you fund people who just admitted <laughs> in front of you that they know no more than 10% of what they need to know? I mean, you wouldn't put your money on somebody like that, would you? And they did. And the reason they did is fundamental. And that is that from the public health standpoint, if you look at the challenges of today, worldwide, every government is faced with a crisis. Whether it be developed governments like the U.S., where 18% of GDP is being used for healthcare, eating away every other prospect of investing in education, in infrastructure, in more research. I mean, today, if you look at the problems in Europe, the same issue occurs. But if you think it's a problem of developed economies who have poorly invested in healthcare, you're wrong. Uh, 
I was talking with Minister Jane yesterday, same thing in India. Even though India spends 1% or 1.5% today, the growth rate is astronomical. It's going to double in a few years, much faster than economic growth. Very, very difficult to manage. At the same time, as we've seen, an epidemiological transition. So these are what I call the rocks of our issues. We are facing a perfect storm of events that are very hard to, for us to manage as a single institution, a single country, a single, no one has the ability to truly uh, encompass this, given the fact that populations today, people today, expect healthcare to be a human right. They don't think healthcare is a privilege like they used to in the 30s and 40s and 50s. You know, people said, well, tough luck, you don't have the money to pay for a doctor or pay for medicine. In the 60s, things changed. Uh, with the Medicare system in, in the U.S., with the insurance schemes in Europe, it became more of a human right, not a privilege. And so we're facing tensions from the science standpoint with this sort of block, which I call the translational block, made up of this complexity and this heterogeneity, whereby one size fits all is no longer possible. Then we have a societal expectation barrier, which is you can no longer just expect to have you being welcomed for any drug you come up with or any new therapy because we can't afford it and it's actually bankrupting uh, societies. And then the third one is that we are dealing with a landscape of disease that is different than what it was 30, 40 years ago. 30, 40 years ago, acute uh, disease was the core issue. Today, 80% of spending is on chronic diseases. And it doesn't spare uh, emerging economies. It's the same thing. In fact, they have a double issue. They still have the diseases of you know, poor infrastructure and the diseases of the modern world, all at the same time with populations that are six, seven times what they used to be 50 years ago. And so we, have a, we are at the core of this. And this is where the U.S. in the Chamber of Commerce really comes in. Why? Because if you believe what I said, it is the, going to be very important from the scientific standpoint to recognize one thing. We have made great progress in understanding biology, but we have not made great progress in understanding disease biology, and even less so in what I call the emerging disease challenges of today. It would be Alzheimer's disease, neurodegeneration, cancer, what you name it. We don't really know the fundamental causes. Second, that means that we will have to get much closer to human pathology and pathogenesis in disease populations, which means a completely different model of research and innovation, which is no longer the linear model. We have some bench experiments, and then we go to the bedside, and then the bedside to a population, population to society, I mean patient groups to society. That model is over. And we cannot, therefore, use an R&D model that is closed in. It has to be open. And it has to be open in a way that is scientifically rigorous to have an understanding as early as possible of the human population, which is heterogeneous at the same time. The new tools are here. I mean, genomics is extraordinarily powerful. The cost of genome sequencing has come down. We can certainly look at different pathways in tumors today with very small samples. We're looking at single cell sequencing, single cell proteomics. The explosion of knowledge should really pay off. But at the end of the day, we're in a race, in the race between this dragon of healthcare costs, which is really bankrupting governments and being scary on the population, who says, I may not have the science and innovation and technologies that will preserve me from having Alzheimer's disease at age 70 or diabetes with comorbidities. Remember, it's a pandemic and on and on. So as a community, we really have to come together. And I, I was uh, discussing yesterday, number one, whatever happens, you need a level playing field and a transparent approach to these issues. Number two, we need much closer partnerships in what I call the pre-competitive space. It is not possible, even for NIH, I used to say, even NIH does not have, with $30 billion of research, does not have the skill set or access or understanding 
of all that needs, that needs to be understood in what we do. Therefore, at the end of the day, the pre-competitive space needs to be enriched. Access to what I call translational capabilities for a wider group worldwide so that we can do what we call, you know, uh, Bill Chin calls it big data analysis so that we can in fact extract knowledge directly from the species we're here to treat, humans, not mice, in the lab. So I'm, I'm being facetious, we need obviously very good basic research, but it's not sufficient. Today, no research project can succeed without a comprehensive, multidisciplinary approach that comes from different fields of science, whether it be regulatory or population science or basic biology or biochemistry, they need to come together. And you know, I learned one thing. The strength and power of a multidisciplinary team is not determined by its best members, but it's determined by its weakest link. So we need to work on finding what the weakest link is, and that's what we at, at Sanofi say, we need to reinvent R&D. We need to have it based on very strong, you know, rigorous principles of translational medicine, as we know it, and people, we can discuss what that is, based on open innovation in a multidisciplinary environment where you can access in a network basis to the best people in the world, the best people anywhere, to come and participate. It also requires a really a public-private partnership approach. There is no way that we will understand disease heterogeneity and reclassify these diseases without participation by patients, by academic institutions, by scientists, by government, with proper regulations that are based on trust and transparency. So that's a pre-competitive space that we need to build worldwide. Last but not least is the sense that you need to build on your strength and you need to really understand what those strengths are. And in the case of US India, I, I went to India uh, several times and had uh, quite a bit of interactions there when they're last October. It's really interesting. I can tell you what the one single world word that I remember from my trip, which I learned there. And I, I learned it in Bangalore from a, uh, this was the Biological Science Institute that is being built there. And um, uh, somebody was telling me about the, um, the filtration of water. There's a system that has been developed there uh, that allows you basically on-site filtration at very low cost. And I said, well, that's interesting. He said, Elias, listen, in, 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 the, in the world, we need to come up with a, and promote the concept of frugal innovation. And you know, it's very true. Frugal innovation can be applied to many systems. And one of the most impressive ones was actually the innovation I saw there in healthcare delivery. And there are good reasons for that. I mean, the cost of labor is completely different, but still, when you went to the hospitals where, and I'm um, Dr. Shetty, uh, the, the surgeon who created this hospital, created a system where they can basically perform cardiac surgery uh, on a huge number of patients at a tenth of the cost that would be applied in the U.S. So systems implementations, what I call operational research, that's an area where I find India to be extremely uh, creative and extremely positive, you know, extremely able to in fact teach the rest of the world how not to do what we did, which was to build huge infrastructures for acute diseases, which are no longer the problems of today. The use of mHealth, the use of eHealth. There's a university there that has four million students with electronic uh, health, um, uh, electronic education, basically. So I think in, 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 the con in the concept of healthcare innovation and the area of healthcare innovation, I, th I see that as being strong. The second areas innovation, we work clearly with emerging companies and we have three projects already active with excellent collaborations. Last but not least is that, you know, India has a great combination of engineering talent, scientific talent. As I said, in biological sciences, it's really rising. And it is that multidisciplinarity that really needs to be uh, made use of at the, uh, to the maximum extent possible. So I said that I would not give a, a big speech, but it's already a big speech, so I'll stop right here, and I'd love to take uh, give and take and questions and comments if, if uh, allowed, Martin.
This is an inspiring speech, thanks. Um, Thank my question is with open innovation. Um, how do you distinguish between find, looking at diseases and trying to understand, say, how to make that disease clinically feasible versus identifying new targets and ways to, to, um, to treat the disease, which becomes more of a proprietary issue? Right, so I think it's a central question. Fundamentally, I think understanding disease pathogenesis is, uh, is frankly a common good, right? And it's done, clearly, it has to be done with new approaches, new methods. And sometimes what you find is what I tell my academic colleagues when I was at Hopkins, I had the patients, I didn't have the tools. The industry had the tools, but not the patients. And so we have to find different ways of understanding that. But frankly, uh, the, 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 the world is going to to pick the target should be your choice, and to develop the appropriate modality to, to address the target is your choice. Now, clearly, uh, we are not able to address all the targets we know. We are not able to stratify the targets we think are important, and we have no real quick way of demonstrating the validity of a target. So target validation is important. That's why we have the consortium with, you know, NIH, Francis Collins, and we have, we're working and collaborating there. I think it's going to be, you know, something that we need to uh, work on, but I still believe innovation and uh, modalities. I mean, are you going to use RNAs, DNA, um, you know, um, uh, natural products? That's your innovation. That's something no one else can do. And really, with the consolidation of the industry worldwide, fewer and fewer entities are able to do that globally. And that, to me, means that we absolutely have to use a not a pyramidal system of innovation, but a network system of innovation, just like other industries have done. I mean, you look at my iPhone, it's 95% networked. It's not built by Apple. Yes? Hold on a second. Just, uh... Uh, you talk about the population, uh, different communities. And uh, there is a difference uh, depending uh, on their ethnicity and uh, geographic situation. Uh, their whole genome is different from one area to different. How do you see the collaboration of um, uh, industry and academia there in such situation? Right, so it's the issue of heterogeneity and variation. Now, I make it an issue because it's really relevant in the disease uh, context, but really, frankly, when you study it, the variation is not as large as what we thought. In fact, when you look at the genomic evolution, it's clear that all of the human population outside of Africa has come out of 10,000 individuals. And so it's actually not as much variation as we think, but there are really uh, individual variations in specific enzyme systems, specific categories, specific, you know, founder effects. In other words, I'm not a geneticist, but clearly we need to study that better and understand it, because naturally you'll say, well, I'm different uh, in China than I am in India and than I am in Europe. But I think we need to have the science for that. So in diabetes, for example, we do know that uh, patients in China and, and Japan get diabetes sooner and at lower BMIs than, than Caucasians. We know that in America, when we see the differences between South Americans and uh, North Americans in terms of diabetes uh, susceptibility. We're still in the process of knowing this, but that, I think, requires an international effort by nature, by definition. I mean, you can't really do it unless you have a complete collaboration and cooperation around, around the world on this. And it's happening. I mean, I'm very optimistic, actually, that it's, um, you know, happening with the collaborations within the research consortia that we have. We have the Thousand Genome Project, which is a worldwide project at NIH, but also collaborating with everybody. You just heard the announcement of the Beijing, Beijing Genome Institute, the NIH Sanger, to look at those. So it's going to take a few years, but I think it's, it's, it shouldn't be exaggerated because I think people a lot of times think, you know, we're so different. We're not that different uh, outside, uh, you know, from one region of the world to another, but there are significant differences. I mean, there, you know, the, the issue of alcohol uh, metabolism, for example, is a very well-known one, uh, which was discovered 
several, many years ago, where there is an enzyme deficiency in the uh, Asian population that clearly needs to be taken into account when you do this. But I think that mapping uh, needs to occur and is occurring. Hi, good morning. Uh, so I had a question uh, relative to the R&D investments uh, by pharmaceutical and biotech companies in India. Uh, just recently I was reading an article that uh, over the last couple of years looks like there has been a uh, reduction in the investment funds by uh, the large pharmaceutical companies in, uh, in India. In, uh, and I'm wondering that, is there a correlation between that and the last couple of years of uh, sort of a slow economy uh, in India? Just wanted to get your perspective on that. So I think there are two, two responses to this. One is a macro global phenomenon, and then one may be a more regional one. The, at the macro level, what you have is, an, is, is essentially the patent cliff which really eliminates $250 billion of revenues worldwide, which you have to take into account. So what I've learned, uh, and I, you know, I love to go from one world to another and learn something. I've learned that uh, when you look at your uh, um, uh, you know, efficiency of your operation, you realize that you can't not spend infinitely, infinite amounts of R&D money while at the same time your sales are expanding. So there's been a contraction I would say worldwide of uh, spend on R&D, and you can hear it. I mean, you look at the news, closing that center, closing this center. So that's one cause, and if you look at the numbers, I don't know what they are, but I would say 20, 25%. Maybe Marty uh, can tell us, Marty Mackay knows uh, very well this global trend of reducing R&D expenses to match the, the revenues, which are, you know, every country in the world right now is seeing a decrease in total bill for drugs because of gener generification of drugs. U.S. minus 3%. So it's, it's really happening in that way. The second uh, trend is this, um, the trend of going away from the model of what I call corporate R&D empires. And what I mean by that is if you looked at the 60s and 70s, every corporation in the world uh, had their, what I call their prisoner R&D corporate structures. So you had IBM with the IBM Research Center and the Xerox Park and so on. People have realized that that's a way to, a sure way to kill innovation. Uh, Bell Labs and so on. So they've gone away from that. Now today in every industry except pharma, except pharma, which has the, had the luxury of being able to sustain these, you know, completely um, uh, um, inward oriented research systems. So you have a deinvestment then because of the changing of what I said. You go to open innovation. So investment is made more into a flexible way and you reduce a lot of infrastructure. As far as India is concerned, I think that's part of the global phenomenon and um, some, uh, perhaps some uh, issues we talked with the minister about, you know, in, 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 in clinical research, we, we are, we have to tackle the issues of liability, adverse events and so on. Um, in early research, we really have to tackle the issues of intellectual property and make sure that the partnerships that we have are protected in terms of what the investments are. So it's complex, but by and large, there's been a, a reduction of R&D expenses in the industry globally. And you're seeing that everywhere. Following up on your theme of, of using the Xerox Park analogy, is it part of the issue with pharma that the therapeutic area categories themselves are still too big? Rather than having the infrastructure of an oncology franchise, you know, a lot of the successes are coming from biotech companies, innovations that have a subset of that. So right. is, is in fact, that's the, is that the next step of right. efficiency? You know, I, I'm not from the industry. I came out of left field, so I'm not the best person to talk to. I'm, I'm new to this. and. And I came out of academia and government, and I really had no idea about how the industry worked. I did externally. But once you get in, you realize that, you know, it's like everything else. Uh, I had total confidence that the problem was simple, like everybody has when they tackle a new problem until they get the details. And <laughs> so, so what I think you need to separate the issue of R from the issue of D. So when you look at the issue of R, of you know, innovation, breakthroughs, new methodologies, new technologies, and so on, if you are a big organization that has an R and a D, you have to feed both things. And if you are successful in R in one period of your history, then you start funding your D, which by definition forces you into a cycle 
which defunds R. Where is R occurring? It occurs outside. Why is that? Is that bad? No, I think it's good. It's what happened after the Bayh-Dole Act in the US and many other like legislations. So I think what you see is that early creative activities are best distributed in where, they, where it occurs. I mean, frankly, if you're locked in into a concentration camp called a corporate R&D in the middle of nowhere, you will be productive for five or eight years and, ten, and then you have to support D. You have to fund the projects. You're successful now. So it's, a, it's not a phenomenon that's inherent to being small or large. It's inherent to the cycle of R&D, in my opinion. I'm not the expert, but that's my feeling. And I think you need to break that cycle because, frankly, small size or large size is not the, uh, the problem. Actually, if you look at data, molecules coming out of biotech are no more likely, actually less likely, to be successful than molecules coming out of corporate research in the current sense. So it's not, that is not the answer, I think. But I think focusing is another topic that people come about and say, oh, why don't you just do oncology? The problem with that that I see is that oncology research is evolving. It does appeal, it does track to immunology, it does appeal on, and if you have orthodoxy, you are killed, you're, you're dead, because no new ideas will come from the transverse cross-fertilization. So the question to me is, and at the deeper level, if indeed the structure, the molecular structure of the pathways that lead to a disease process are modular enough that they don't appeal to, you know, cross-regulation, nervous system, immune system, and so on, well, then you're right. But I don't think that nature is like that. I think nature is cross-interactive. The immune system responds, the, the nervous system responds, the vascular system responds. So I think you should be, in my view, um, driven by, by the ability to cross-fertilize, distribute the research to where it's happening, work with the innovators, but D is different. D is discipline. D is performance. D is absolutely what makes us trusted by regulators that you have to do this and, and you have to manufacture in a way that you're confident that you are really producing something for the patients that is trusted. Thank you. Hi, uh, drug discovery pipeline is drying up. Most of the diseases are grouped as chronic diseases now. There is a serious concern about adverse drug reactions today in today's world about chemical pharmaceutical drugs which we have. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear what uh, you're too close to the, it, it resonates, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. Yeah. I said the drug discovery pipeline is drying up, all of us know it. Uh, most of the diseases are grouped as chronic diseases. Adverse drug reactions of uh, pharmaceutical drugs is a serious concern. All of us are aware of it. So my question is, isn't it a time to rethink the way we are going, the direction we have to take? Isn't it time to have a more holistic thinking on healthcare and drug development? Why can't we think of uh, going back to nature, maybe focus on more on botanicals? Like India and China have, India has a strong base of Ayurvedic medicines. China, TCM is there. For thousands of years, we have been taking care of health of people over there. So isn't it time for the you know, pharma industry to really focus on uh, natural products more and maybe specifically on uh, botanicals, please? Yeah, it's a tough question, it's a good question. I think people treat themselves the way they see, you know, we're human beings and human beings have a, a certain relationship to their expectations and beliefs. And you know, traditional medicine has been here for years and centuries and thousands of years it benefits from an evolutionary selection process, just like natural products have been naturally selected by evolution. So I think you need to look at that. I don't think you should discourage it. I don't think it should, is the, in, the sole solution. I don't think we should close our labs and go to translation to traditional medicine. So we should learn from each. I, Artemisinin is a good example. Uh, Vancristin is a good example. I mean, there's no question that co-evolving biological systems are gonna learn from each other and you need to study that. We did a study in, uh, with the University of Hong Kong in China. You know, in China you have a component of uh, traditional Chinese medicine which is ubiquitous and you see it everywhere. So you ask the typical question, is the PKPD the same from one to the other? And we found that no, 
In fact, if you get one from the northern region, it's actually very different than one from the other region. And then we did genomics of the particular uh, component, and we found that, in fact, only in a region that came, only in one particular region, in a particular environment with the right genome, did you find the uh, effect. So we can help uh, with these methods and integrating these methods to improve, in fact, uh, Chinese or traditional Ayurvedic medicine, but it's not the only solution. I funded a company with a, with a venture fund here in Boston to reignite re, re, uh, the potential of natural products. Why? Because we had a genomic technique that allowed us to read the DNA of these uh, natural organisms in a way that would be more predictive. But I don't think the regulator it has uh, the ability to say, well, just concoct this and, and I'm going to regulate that very easily. Uh, in the U.S., it's, it's herbal is excluded from the regulators for reasons that are simple. You cannot actually guarantee lot-to-lot -lot reproducibility, nor genomic identity, nor a PKPD uh, uh, thing. So as long as we haven't gotten there, it's very difficult for me to see how you would improve on, the, on what we know today. It's a complex answer, but it's a great question. <laughs> Thank Dr. you Rodi, very much. Uh, oh, sorry, really, Mark. really elegant uh, presentation. I'm really enjoying this discussion. I have a question, which is really not even pertains, pertains to India, but even to the United States setting, and, and what I call the multiple myeloma problem. So, just in two, uh, two year 2000, you know, we didn't have any drugs, so they costed about thousand dollars or so. Then came Valcade, and the price went up, and now a couple of more drugs have been approved. And our patients are living four years longer, and the drugs right. cost 250000 and they are they're given chronically. Right. And that's just one example in oncology. Uh, and I know Raju is uh, chairing a panel discussion later on, but I want to take, uh, get your take on that. So yep. how do you reconcile with that reality, not only for this country, but get in, I mean, India, $250,000 for a drug is just uh, beyond the rim of yep. uh, just the very top, maybe 15% yep. even. Yep. How do we reconcile that with the other reality, which is uh, the tough study, which is showing to bring a drug, an oncology drug at least, to a market, it takes 1.2 to $2 billion because right. of success, failure rates are so high. Yeah. So unless we spend 1.2 to $2 billion, we cannot come up with a drug. And if we come up with a drug, we need to recuperate that cost, so it costs 250000 right. even half a million dollars by the time for orphan diseases. So how do we? How do we do this for not only India, but even here? Yeah. And the second related question is with the genomics, we are finding out that the, almost every disease is becoming an orphan disease. 5% of lung cancer have certain mutation, 1% of this cancer. So they're all turning into orphan diseases, and therefore the drug costs are going to be a lot more, similar to the Genzyme model, Sanofi model now. So, this is a very large question, and I know Raju and others will be discussing this, but since you've been in industry and academia and yeah. government, I wanted uh, to take, get your take on that. It's a, it's a very important question. We discussed it this morning, actually. Um, it's called stacking, you know, because uh, you have multiple drugs which are designed as if it was one drug, one disease, one patient. Today, we know that cancer is not one cause. It's multiple causes acting at once. And so combination therapies are going to be very important. Actually, if you buy the argument that I gave that one, biology is complex, two, it's heterogeneous, and, two is, and three, it's cross-talking between immunology and, and, and you know, uh, epithelial development, whatever you talk, I mean, if you combine these three, you realize that there isn't a disease that you're going to be able to treat with one drug. And so at the end of the day, you're going to have this mechanics. I don't have the answer. So let me pre say it's an important question. I don't have the answer. But I think there may, may be ways to think about it in the sense that, yeah, well, this orphan disease uh, idea, frankly, if indeed we have common pathways of disease, let's say, you know, um, uh, driver mutations in cancer, well, we maybe do a study and find that it is really relevant in breast cancer, but then you do a genomic expression study and you find that it's the dominant driver mutation in 10 other cancers. Well, the regulators will have to sort of help us and say, okay, how do we use this compound in renal cancer or in lung cancer? And this is happening clinically. So you have diagnostics companies that are trying to do trials on the basis of what I call disease characterization panels. 
And this is something that, you know, Martin, you know, we've been talking about as R&D has trying to say the advances in diagnostics platforms, platforms, not one test at a time, to better characterize disease processes will actually help us and potentially create not the 1%, 1%, 1%, but it could be 1% of breast cancers, 1% of lung cancers, 1% of, and at the end of the day, it makes a, 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 a tenable uh, economic situation, if I may finish. The, so therefore, at the end of the day, if you analyze it all the way to its end point, the perfect state 10,000 years from now is when pharmacopoeia is a mirror image of disease biology. I don't think we know what that is, but at the end of the day, that's where we have to evolve. And whether or not it's a, you know, a epigenetic uh, control of some kind that is common to many diseases or a driver mutation or something, I don't know. But uh, frankly, uh, stacking of costs is another issue which is socioeconomic. And I think we have to come up with a global understanding of what is the value of a medicine. We cannot have a human rights approach to healthcare without a value to it. And the problem right now is that there is a huge uh, change. I was in the UK uh, last week and I talked to the folks that, um, you know, who do NICE and do the studies and they say, oh, it's a quality, it's a quality adjusted life here. And in, in the UK, it's the average cost of, I mean, average uh, um, uh, per capita income, $40,000 or whatever it is. And I said, you know, I mean, it sounds good, but I don't think a quality of a 10-year-old is worth the quality of a 90-year-old. And you have no correction for that. So how am I going to be motivated and how are you going to value the quality of a 10-year-old, a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old? In the U.S., you know, with the advances in cardiovascular care, we reduce mortality and morbidity of cardiovascular coronary disease by 70% and stroke 70%. Are you going to value the quality of that as $40,000? No. In many, in many instances, we've created economic value which has been evaluated at $2.5 trillion. Why? Because instead of dying at 40, this population is dying now much later and is having Alzheimer's disease, but has been productive for the 25 years that they were stayed alive. So is it really a, a good approach, a smart approach to say we have one measure, it's applied systematically and so on. Now, on the other hand, I would agree that no measures is worse than a bad measure. But I think a bad measure that can be improved over time is going to be necessary to address that problem. Um, Elias, um, I wanted you to sort of comment further on the lesson that you learned in India last fall. You talked about frugal innovation. Right. We understand that if one is challenged that is to disrupt what we're doing. We need to ask ourselves, how do we get from a therapy that is $10, $100 a day to something that is a dollar a day, or a diagnostic that is not, not, uh, not $10, but a dollar or even 10 cents? Could you just comment further on how you view this now, as you come back, and how India might play a role in helping us disrupt what we do, because the only way to get to that level of efficiency or frugality is to change what we do. Yeah. Yeah, it, it relates to two, two categories. One is what I call operational research impact or implementation research. I mean, they're doing things that no other uh, country is doing. You know, when you look at uh, some of the healthcare systems and the uh, utilization of technology, uh, this example in Bangalore is remarkable. There's another one I saw for eye disease. It's almost like a, 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 a outpatient-driven, fast turnaround, systematic uh, use of uh, the best resource there, which is uh, um, uh, labor uh, cost that is low. So it's frugal in the sense that, that is applicable to India, but they've export, they're exporting this. They, they built a hospital model, which cost you $10 million, for cardiovascular uh, interventions, and they're exporting it to, the, to one of the Caribbean countries. So that's the kind of things where this operational research is sort of getting rid of what we know is badly designed in our system. So you get frugal innovation by ex excluding the, or, or, or engineering out 
all of the non-value added steps of the system, and that's one thing that you can do. The second is what you said about, okay, how do I get a $1 something rather than a $100 system? Most of the cost is not really related to, to the compound that interferes with the patient. When I was at Hopkins, I studied that, and I said, why are our costs going so high? In the U.S., it's the opposite situation. Technology in, in, in innovation is actually a small component of the cost. The larger component of the cost is health count, personnel, people. And if you look, um, when you looked at uh, the files in the 1980s, 70s uh, at Hopkins, what was the number of FTEs interacting with the patient? You found that it was max three FTEs. It was the doctor, the nurse, and today it's 19 FTEs because you have the radi radiology, the pathology, the this and that and the other. And these 19 really add up costs. Eighty percent of costs in the U.S. is, is really a, um, a labor cost issue. The one trillion dollar that we spend more than Germany on an equal basis is due to administrative issues, $300 billion of insurance and, and, and billings and counter billings, protective medicine for, and, uh, you know, from lawyers and so on, $60 billion. And the rest of it is basically health care uh, um, is cost of uh, labor. So frugal innovation is going to be different, different environments. And I think you need to really get there and say, yes, we will provide maximum value at minimum cost. What's the risk? What's the cost benefit? And we're not doing that very well as a country, as an economy, as, a, as an industry. I don't have a solution to tell you I would do this tomorrow, but look at antibodies. I mean, the fact is we're looking for methodologies where the yield, instead of being one gram per liter, is going to be 12, 15 grams. And on, and it's happening, it's, it's there. At that point, you start thinking, well, maybe I could find ways of having a bigger volume, and so therefore you need price going down. But I don't have a solution. Thank you.